imagine for a minute that you are living on the cusp of the shift from one era to another. So, for example, if you were born in the 19th century, mid-19th century, right? And that's the period when the agrarian society was shifting to the industrial age, right? People are all moving to the cities. But if you were living in the middle of that, would you be aware that you were moving from the agrarian era to the industrial era, like right in the middle of it? You might feel a disruption. You might feel that there was a lot of change. But would you actually be able to label it? It's often not until we step back 100 years later that we have the medieval, the Renaissance, and then the, and the information age. But when you're in the middle of it, it's not as obvious. And I suggest to you that we are in the middle of a huge paradigm shift around the landscape of leadership. And those of us that are coaches working with leaders are living in that space every single day. And our leaders are not aware of it because they're living it. So we've all heard the phrase VUCA, right? Volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. But it's often applied to the economy, the politics, and sort of the world that people are living in. The leaders are dealing with a VUCA landscape. But I would suggest that maybe the leadership itself is in VUCA. That the traditional leader format that we've been using for hundreds of years, really, in the West, that I'm calling a heroic leader. My client says, it's the white knight coming in on the horse, right? So the leader that's indi the individual, everything's focused on the leader being in charge. Their characteristics, their charisma, their personality, their attributes, their capabilities, but it's very focused on the central individual, right? And that period may be coming to an end and being replaced by something that I'm calling and some of the other research are calling the post-heroic period of leadership. It's less about the person, the leader, and more about the network, the partnership, the collegiality, the group, the dynamic between leader and follower being more fluid. So let me share you an example of this. I'm recently working with a global pharmaceutical company and one of my clients is a senior vice president of research, and she is a probably late 40s, early 50s, highly accomplished leader. She has lots of letters, so she has an MD, she has an MBA, she may even have a PhD. She's worked her way up. She's been with the firm for 20 years. And she runs the organization, her team, her global team, in a very structured way. And she's a good leader. But she's a bit of a command and control leader. She delegates, she trains her people, she gives feedback, but it's structured. And I recently had an opportunity to work with her and her team, and there was a lot of tension between her and some of the junior staff. And some of the junior staff that are running, you know, they're supervisors, so they're also leaders, but they're running smaller subsets of the organization. One of them, probably around 28, 30 years old, was clearly creating a lot of tension with his boss. And as the sort of team coach, I'm facilitating, I was very much aware that the two of them were not seeing eye to eye. And it's just a different value set. You know, this younger leader was wanting to move fast. He was not interested in following the protocol. And the best example of all of this sort of tension was he had recently sent an email directly to the CEO. Now, for my client, who had worked her way up through 20 years and had probably met the CEO like three times, here is this young upstart that works for her who sends emails directly to the CEO. And you could feel the tension between them. And the question that I was sitting with is, is one right and one wrong? I had an opportunity to meet with him later, the junior person, because he's also a leader and he's part of the leadership team, so he was getting at least an introduction to coaching. And I brought it up. I said to him, what about the tension, the feeling between the two of you? And he said, eh, I just want to go to the person that needs to be, he's the one that needed the information. I don't need to go through the layers. And I'm frustrated that I'm not getting feedback on a regular basis. 
And so why do we have to climb the corporate ladder? And I want my team to be able to work 24 hours a day. I want them to be flexible and fluid and to be able to feel like we're all part of the same conversation. The boss, is, she's very hierarchical. So as I'm listening to this, and I'm seeing this in many, many different variations, a lot of different organizations, I come to see that there's this sort of tectonic plates of leadership that are crashing. And as coaches, when we run up against those situations, the question becomes, how do you support the heroic leader to be effective, and how do you support the post-heroic leader to be effective? And is it one right and one wrong? And over a couple of years of working with a whole different variety of people in this different kinds of, in this context, I set up a, a framework that helps my clients explore the way they operate as leaders within the dimensions of both a pre-heroic or a heroic frame and a post-heroic frame. And my standpoint on this is that there's nothing wrong with either one, that a lot of it depends on the context. Those of you that are familiar with Barbara Kellerman's work, she recently wrote a book called Hard Times about leadership in America. And I think it's appropriate for the West. And her fundamental theme was that it's all about context. So it's not that the heroic leader is dead. It may be dissolving, it may be dissembling, it may be shifting, but it's not being replaced. I also have post-heroic millennials who want a boss at times. They want direction. So I've developed a framework that I want to share with you just briefly that helps clients, whether in post-heroic stance or pre -her or heroic positions, to be able to look at themselves and discover their strengths along a set of spectrum, along the spectrum. And the key is not to choose to be heroic or to be post-heroic, but to be able to decide to grow in the direction that will be a sign of agility and a sign of expansion in one direction or the other. So the younger millennial may need to lead to be, learn to be more directive. And the senior vice president may, lead, may need to learn to come off her perch and be more in partnership with her staff. So there are six dimensions. I just want to go quickly through the six dimensions that I work with. The first is flexibility. Makes sense, right? And it's about leadership style. If you're a type A autocratic style leader, then that's very much part of the heroic stance. The post-heroic stance is gonna be more grounded and receptive, more dialogical, more asking questions and not saying so much, this is the way it is. And there's a whole range in between. So flexible in your leadership style. The second is intentional. How do you communicate with your people and what is the intention that you share as a leader with the group? The more traditional or heroic stance would be rational, right? Strategic plans, PowerPoints, data-driven, results-oriented. We all know that, the vision, the mission, the goals, right? That's all valid, but in the post-heroic stance, a lot of the time, the younger folks, and not just, it's not just young folks, but high-tech workers, startups, they want meaning, purpose, impact. They want aspirational communication. They want to bring the emotional context. They want storytelling. Myth, symbol, ritual. They're not right or wrong, but they're very different in their way of intending the communication. A third is emotional agility. We're familiar with emotional intelligence, but with a traditional heroic leader, they would typically keep the emotions in the background. The idea is to be rational and somewhat stoic and clear, data-driven. Post-heroic leaders are going to be more willing to share their feelings. They're familiar with emotional intelligence. They want to get in touch with feelings. So they're aware of them, they're expressing them, and they're regulating them, and they're connecting emotionally to others. A fourth dimension I call authenticity or realness. So again, the traditional leader would be stoic, conservative, and somewhat closed, kind of like the old therapist, blank slate, right? Post-heroic would be much more open, familiar with the power of vulnerability, the fact that being vulnerable is not a weakness. It can sometimes be a strength. This could be a real challenge for the heroic leader, and there's a whole spectrum in between. And then the last two dimensions are collaboration. And if you think about the way that you collaborate with your team as a leader, traditionally, the heroic stance would be delegating, 
directing, setting goals, advising, and mentoring, right? But you're really basically power over. Very clearly, when you shift into a post-heroic stance, it's power with. It becomes us, dialogue, partnership. And you may be able to move back and forth between them, but they're very different lenses depending upon how you're collaborating with your team. And then finally, engagement. Engagement is about the energy you share physically and emotionally and mentally with the team. So are you driven, type A, separate work from family, results, goal-oriented, drive to succeed? That's pretty much the traditional heroic approach, right? My client that I mentioned, I mean, she was like, work until you're done. The post-heroic wouldn't necessarily say that was inappropriate, but there might be more work-life balance, there might be more fluidity, there might be a focus on being creative, which sometimes looks messy, it's less structured. So a willingness to be more fluid. You see these new startup environments where there's no offices and you know, there's skateboards and you know, so it's just a much more dynamic, fluid environment. And again, not, one's not right, one's not wrong. My goal as a coach is to help the clients get in touch with the strengths that they bring, their natural comfort zones and their aptitudes, and then to be able to shift in the direction that will help them depending upon the context. And if you think about flexible, intentional, emotional, real, collaborative, and engaged, it adds up to fierce. And I use that just as a way to help the clients remember. It's not about being heroic, it's not about being post-heroic, but you can be fierce as a leader and effective. And I'll leave you just with one last thought. As a coach, I use that model on myself. And I suggest that we as coaches can use it for ourselves. In other words, am I flexible as a coach? Am I directive? Am I receptive? Am I intentional in my communication? Am I aspirational with my clients? Or am I very data-driven with my clients? And how do I communicate? Where does the emotional quotient fit into my communication? Emotions. Am I emotionally agile with my clients? Do I actually express feelings or do I stand back? as a coach. And again, there may be appropriate context to do both, but do I have an awareness of what I'm doing? Authenticity. Is it okay to be vulnerable as a coach? Collaboration. There's a, automatically we think as a coach you're a partner, it's dialogical, but you know the reality is that when you're in a coach-client dynamic, there's power, automatic. You're kind of in charge because you're the coach, they're the client. You're the doctor, they're the patient. So if you want to shift that energy, you have to have an awareness that it's even there. And then finally, engagement. Are you engaging with your clients in all the different ways that we can engage today and how does that work? Do you use Skype? Do you use phone? Do you do face-to-face? -face? They're all very different. They all bring very different kinds of energies and they can all work. So I like to use the model for my clients and I think it's really valuable as role models for our clients that we use the model on ourselves. So we can have fierce leaders and hopefully be fierce coaches. Thank you.